Dwight Dewey Riley was born in 1971. He was the firstborn of Mr. Riley, who we never meet, and Mrs. Riley, who was present in 1996. Around 1978 or 79, Dewey's younger sister Tatum was born. The Riley family lived in the Northern California town of Woodsboro. Despite it being a small town, Dewey doesn't seem to have many friends. Maybe his classmates moved on to San Francisco while he stayed back in the suburbs. As a 24-year-old, Dewey watched sensational, or trash, news show Top Story, unaware that he would meet the host, Gail Weathers, a year later. In September 1996, Dewey was 25 years old and in his first year as a deputy. Despite carrying a badge and gun, he was receiving very little respect at work and at home. But when a gutsy murder takes place nearby, Dewey finds that he has an opportunity to gain a little respect. The killer, soon to be infamously known as Ghostface, was cutting through his sister's high school. And though he doesn't instill a lot of faith from his peers, Deputy Dewey is going to do everything he can, even if no one else cares. Because he does. To learn how and why Dewey Riley became the hero of the Scream franchise, how his on-screen relationship with Gale came true in real life, and what this could mean for future Scream installments, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History. Of the two characters initially destined to die in the original 1996 Scream, it was Deputy, then Private Citizen, then Technical Advisor, then Sheriff Dewey Riley who became the hero. David Arquette, the actor, former professional wrestler, and certified Bob Ross instructor infused a lot of his actual self into the character of Dewey Riley. In an interview with Variety, he stated, Dewey always had this love of Clint Eastwood and wanting to be the sort of macho kind of tough guy grizzled person, but he never was. That's how I approached the character from the start. He tried to be tough and the Sheriff but he wouldn't get the respect. It goes back to the classic line in the first one. When I wear this badge, you treat me like a man of the law. He's really not that person. The desire to be a Clint Eastwood type of character is reflected in Dewey's theme song, which was originally composed for the 1996 movie Broken Arrow. It was used in Scream 2 as a temp track, but left ultimately in the final film. As with the music, Dewey's character was kept alive by a series of missteps and last minute decisions. As the franchise grew, Dewey's life was also shaped by the life of David Arquette, helping him evolve into the cowboy hero of the franchise. But to understand how he got there, we've got to take it back to the Ghostface origins in the late 90s. On what would have been a quiet night in September, the Woodsboro Police Department received a 911 call that would change everything and arrive on the scene to find high school student Casey Becker gutted in a tree. Considering Casey was in the same class as Dewey's sister, this must have hit him a little closer to home. Dewey's early introduction to what would become known as the Woodsboro murders had him taking his position as deputy very seriously, regardless of the response from everyone. Dewey was saying this is the worst crime we've seen in years, even worse than the next morning, there's a strange feeling in the air of Woodsboro High School as the media swarm the quad. The sheriff brings Dewey along to interrogate the entire school, likely because he's the youngest member of the force and probably has familiarity with the student body because of his sister. Sheriff Burke, Dewey? Uh. That's Deputy Riley today, Sid. Right off the bat, we see that Dewey is struggling to get a girl seven years his junior to respect his title as deputy. When interviewing Sidney Prescott, he's gently authoritative. It's a quality that would evolve to become both his strongest weapon, and eventually, it would be part of his downfall. Another emergency call comes in later that evening after Sidney is attacked in her home, and Deputy Dewey is the first responder. <laughs> Dewey stakes claim of catching Sydney's boyfriend, Billy Loomis, who is found in Sydney's house with a cell phone. He isn't that surprised that it might be Billy, evidence that he has the potential instinct to catch criminals, despite his Barney fiefdom. While Sid sits for another round of questioning conducted by Dewey, let's examine his desk. Cosmic cop packaging taped to his computer monitor, orange plastic handcuffs, a toy police car, and a squirt gun. It's easy to imagine that these were gag gifts from the other officers, basically mocking and hazing Dewey for being the youngest of the force. But the cops do at least take him somewhat seriously, at least compared to how he's treated by his sister. God damn it, Dewey! <laughs> well, what did Mama tell you? When I wear this badge, you treat me like a man of the law. I'm sorry, Deputy Dewey boy, but we're ready to go now, okay? The tremble in his voice and childish need to look to a real adult to control Tatum is perhaps the best example of where Dewey stands as a man. He's my superior! The janitor is your superior. An analysis of Dewey can't be done without also mentioning the franchise-long romance that developed between him and journalist Gail Weathers. The first encounter of these star-crossed lovers comes as Dewey tries to sneak Tatum and Sydney out the back door of the police station to avoid the media, and Gail ambushes Sydney while Dewey is busy pulling up the car. Oh! 
Nice shot. No, I mean, camera. Despite being a fan of Gail's show, he turns a blind eye to the assault, keeping in mind what Sydney has been through over the last year, and even brings her an ice pack for her bruised hand when she sleeps over that night. But even with the oversight of a cop, no house with a landline is safe from Ghostface. Hello? Hello, Sydney. Leave me alone! Considering the effort it took to get Dewey up when he had pretty much just gone to bed, he must have been in a really deep sleep. Or maybe just having fun with the vacuum cleaner. Hello? In any event, he gets there too late. The next morning, he breaks the news to Sydney about Billy being released on account of his phone bill being clean and assures her that they'll find the killer. While dropping off Tatum and Sydney at school, he formally meets Gail for the first time. They have a flirtatious exchange, but while there is an attraction between them, Gail is clearly trying to manipulate him and compliments him on his chest. Because of my boyish good looks, muscle mass has increased my acceptance as a Sears police officer. Again, this is a theme for Dewey throughout the franchise. He strives for authority, not as a means of control, but as a means of respect, in order to best protect the people he loves. Gail turns up the flattery, but an announcement from Principal Hembry that suspends all classes and institutes a town-wide curfew interrupts her. Gail pushes a little too hard in their back and forth, allowing Dewey to pick up on her insincerity and ice her out. But the exchange still ends on a playful note. If I may say so, Miss Weathers. You are much prettier in person. From the beginning, Dewey saw something in Gale that no one else saw. But after the town shuts down for curfew, Dewey would make a mistake that would haunt him for the rest of his life. While Tatum and Sydney shop for snacks, Dewey treats himself to an ice cream cone and runs into Sheriff Burke. The image of Sheriff Burke stress smoking while Dewey licks an ice cream cone is a good visual reminder of Dewey's young naivete. Sheriff Burke informs Dewey that the Ghostface calls were issued by Neil Prescott's phone, and Dewey assures him that he'll keep an eye on Sydney. Is his botched attempt to put on his sunglasses a foreshadowing of his future missteps? Maybe not, but it's still funny. That night, he drops Sydney and Tatum off at Stu Mocker's house, where the youth of America are having a party, but the eye he's supposed to be keeping on Sid is distracted when he runs into Gail Weathers again. Flustered by her presence, he foolishly allows her to join as he checks out the party. Upon entering, he pretends like he's gonna bust a kid for underage drinking, only to tell him that he's kidding and to have a good time. Just as he wanted Tatum to respect him in the police station so he could be accepted by his fellow officers, he tries to be the cool cop so he can be liked by this group of high schoolers. Speaking of Tatum, she is not pleased with his guest. Dewey, what is she doing here? She's with me. He's too excited to be seen rolling with a celebrity reporter to remember the bad blood that Sydney has with Gail. Tatum orders him to remove Gail before heading to the garage to get beer. Unfortunately, this interaction is also the last time that Dewey would ever see his sister alive. Shortly after, he gets a report of an abandoned car up the road and uses it as an opportunity to take Gail Weathers on a little murder night stroll. She obliges and the two head off. This time, the flirtation has a little bit more sincerity and they share a little bit about themselves while also physically getting closer. Part of the strength of Dewey and Gail's relationship was each of them willing to be vulnerable with each other so early on. He even shares his real name with her, explaining that the nickname Dewey is just something he got stuck with. It's just this town's way of not taking me serious. What about Gail Weathers? <laughs> Sounds like I'm a meteorologist or something. And speaking of Dewey's authority not being taken seriously, two cars full of teens barrel down the road en route to turning Dewey and Gale into pedestrian casualties. And he tries to somehow get the cars to freeze, which is ineffective. So he throws himself and Gale out of the way at the last second. Lying in a ditch together, Dewey and Gale gaze at each other before sharing their first kiss, which he allows to go on momentarily before pulling away and telling her that he's on duty. It's a great moment of maturity for him. Like earlier, when he stopped to get ice cream while keeping an eye on Sydney, he got distracted momentarily, but this time he quickly corrects course. After Gail notices the abandoned car, Dewey recognizes it as Neil Prescott's, basically concluding that Sydney's father is Ghostface, and rushes with Gail back to the party. In the time they were gone, the party guests mostly cleared out, save for the important characters, and the house is quiet. Dewey instructs Gale to call for backup before charging in gun drawn. As he clears each room, it's obvious he's very scared by the tremor of his gun and his fright at the screaming coming from a movie in the other room. It's a testament to his bravery, but also to his objective, to protect and serve no matter the risk. At some point while searching the house, Stu must have snuck up on him while under the disguise of the ghost face mask and stuck a knife into his back. But even that doesn't stop him from trying to respond to Sydney's screams for help. Keyword, trying. 
And that was the end of Deputy Dwight Dewey Riley. Or it would have been if David Arquette hadn't been so good in the role. As original writer Kevin Williamson recounted, during the course of the movie, we realized how his performance was just so witty. He played it with such heart, such commitment, and everyone kept thinking that. About halfway through it, they were asking me about a sequel because I had already written the outline. They were like, what about the sequel? Why isn't Dewey in the sequel? And so, just in case, we filmed that last sequence of him getting in the ambulance. The decision to keep Dewey alive would become the major shaping force on the entire Scream franchise and link the fictional events to our real world through the actor David Arquette. And it starts with what happens next. Shortly after regaining consciousness, Dewey would have found out about his sister's death, and I'd imagine that his failure to protect her could be part of the reason that he decided to leave the Woodsboro Police Force shortly after, along with his injuries. Due to the nerve damage on his back, he would develop a limp. But letting go of the badge does not mean letting go of his desire to protect. But those who needed protection didn't stick around for long. Sydney and Randy would seemingly graduate early and head off to Windsor College in Ohio. Gail would take off back to New York. After all, they did just meet two days prior, barely. There, she would finish up her book, The Woodsboro Murders, which Dewey was excited to read, only to find that she had portrayed him as a complete idiot. The book was adapted into a movie, Stab, which Dewey doesn't show that much interest in, despite being portrayed by David Schwimmer from Friends. That's honestly understandable, it's a movie about the worst moments of his life. Seeing it alone with none of the other people involved wouldn't have been much fun. But the movie actually creates an opportunity for a reunion. On April 13th, 1997, Dewey sees a report from Windsor College in Ohio regarding the murder of two students the night before at an early screening of Stab. So he got on the first flight he could find. Where a year ago we'd rarely seen him out of uniform, this Dewey is in a baggy jacket holding his right arm awkwardly at his side with a heavy limp. Judging from their reunion, Sydney and Dewey haven't seen each other in a while, and later, Randy asks about Dewey's limp and arm, indicating that he hadn't been in touch since the Woodsboro murders. There may be an explanation for this. Since Scream takes place in September 1996, as evidenced by these calendars, among other things, and Scream 2 takes place in April 1997, which is clearly shown on the movie theater marquee, we can assume that Sydney and Randy didn't make it to the end of the 96-97 high school year, and instead were allowed to graduate early and go directly to college, where they could begin on a winter term. A change of scenery would be healthy for them, even if it means not having time to say goodbye to Dewey. Their reunion, however, could certainly have occurred under happier circumstances. When Dewey finds Sydney at her college campus, he doesn't share what he's specifically been doing for the last year, but it's safe to assume that it's been a lonely one. I just worry. Look, Sid. If there is some freaked out psycho trying to follow in Billy Loomis's footsteps, you probably already know him. Or her. Or them. He's completely right, and even tries to make her aware to be on the lookout for a white male, which is statistically the most probable for a serial killer. Wait a minute. Dewey implores Sydney to be careful and assures her that he'll be hanging around just in case. I always took his involvement to be kind of a cope for him. He wasn't able to save Tatum, so he's gonna try to make up for it by saving her best friend. Sydney has a similar take. Deputy Dewey, what's bro's finest? What's he doing here? He's worried our surrogate big brother. <laughs> It wouldn't be the last time he tried to cope using a surrogate. It was his care for Sydney, though, that brought him out to the Midwest, but he'd also run into someone he didn't care to see. Page 32. Deputy Dewey filled the room with his Barney Fifeish presence. You read my book? Oh, yes, I do read, Miss Weathers. Oh, Dewey, don't take it so seriously. It's a character in a book. Page 41. Deputy Dewey oozed with inexperience. To be fair, Dewey did literally the opposite of what he was told to do by the sheriff in Woodsboro. He left Sydney and Tatum at the party and walked off with Gail down the road. It's all part of the ride, but Gail had a point. However, he feels justified in calling her money hungry and heartless. On the other hand, he's probably the only one who can speak to Gail like that without her going nuclear. How do you know that my dim-witted inexperience isn't merely a subtle form of manipulation used to lower people's expectations, thereby enhancing my ability to effectively maneuver within any given situation? Because your sister wouldn't be dead. <laughs> Dewey is harboring a lot of pain over his characterization in Gail's book, and who can blame him? The year before, he vented to Gail about how he was just trying to get people to call him Dwight, or at least Deputy. And what does she do to the man who risked his life for her? She sees to it that the whole world disrespects him by portraying him as a doofus in her widely published book. Talk about kicking a cripple when he's down. And despite all of that, he still can't help himself from complimenting her hair. 
Nice streaks. That night, student Cece Cooper is stabbed and thrown from the top of her sorority house, and Ghostface goes after Sydney shortly after. Dewey gives chase, but with his limp, Ghostface slips away after leaving a slice in Derek's arm to remember him by. Dewey grows suspicious of Derek's near miss and can't help but play detective when speaking to Windsor's police chief. Do you think someone's trying to duplicate Woodsboro? It looks like it. I think you have a copycat on your hands, G. So Dewey does some of his own investigating with Woodsboro survivor, film expert, and Windsor College film student Randy Meeks. The two run through possible suspects, including Derek and themselves, yet Dewey balks at the idea of Gail being a suspect. He enjoys cutting her down a little, but in the end, he's more willing to make himself a suspect than assume that Gail is a ghost face killer. No, Gail's a lot of things, but Gail's not a killer. Later on the quad, they continue sharing theories which all amount to, incredulously, accepting that these are Woodsboro copycat killings. The first mention of Tatum by name causes Dewey to wince, confirming that there's grief and possibly guilt still there. Before he has time to process that, Gail gets an incoming ghost face call of her own, and Randy picks it up. Seeing an opportunity, Gail and Dewey partner off, leaving Randy to keep Ghostface on the line while they try to search for him. After assaulting several strangers, it dawns on them that they have no idea where Randy is while being pursued by a killer, and Randy becomes the next victim under Dewey's watch, just like Tatum seven months prior. That would not be the only similarity to 1996. Cotton Weary, the number one suspect at the time, is released, much like Billy Loomis. The campus is given an evening curfew. Dewey swears, Cotton or not, that he'll find the guy responsible. And just when it feels like the story might unfold just as it did before, Gail adds a shocking twist. She takes responsibility for herself. I feel bad, Dewey. I feel really bad. I never say that because I never feel bad about anything but I feel bad now. This is huge. Without Gail's sincerity, the two can't fully establish the trust needed to get them through the next couple installments. At first, Dewey is mistrustful, thinking that she's performing, but in the end, they come together out of their mutual desire to bring the culprit to justice. It is perhaps their most important scene together, because from here on out, Dewey and Gail became fully intertwined in the series. Their teamwork quickly pays off when they realize that Gail has crowd footage shot for her story, which they realize might be an excellent place to start looking for the killer. A VHS viewing session in the film's lecture hall leads to Gail apologizing for hurting Dewey's feelings, which leads to an impromptu tryst, and like their moment together before finding Neil Prescott's car, Gail comes to a realization. Dewey, that's not my footage. Someone is playing this additional footage on a second TV, and inevitably, Dewey and Gail find themselves in an old-fashioned ghost face pursuit. They end up separated, with Gail accidentally trapping herself in a recording studio with only one exit. She successfully dodges Ghostface, slipping into the soundproof side of the studio. Dewey, unfortunately, enters on the other side, unaware that Ghostface is in the room. Just as he peers through the window, searching for Gail, Ghostface jams the knife into Dewey's back. With the last of his strength, Dewey finds the mic to yell out a warning to Gail before he's dispatched on the glass beside her. It seemed the events of Woodsboro past really were repeating themselves, because once again, Dewey would find himself out of commission for the finale. But luckily, once again, he leaves the next morning in an ambulance, not a body bag. We see how far Dewey and Gail's relationship has come when she immediately drops her news microphone at the sight of him, unlike their previous adventure, where she was more concerned with getting the shot. According to this first responder, it was actually Dewey's traumatic past that saved his life. Knife went into some old scar tissue. Saved his life. After realizing how much they cared about each other, the two would try to make it work by living in Woodsboro, where Gail took care of him until he was well. But Gail Weathers has never been a small town character and she never misses an opportunity to say this, while Dewey can't seem to go anywhere without bringing Woodsboro with him. If one of them wasn't willing to relocate, then it was never going to work romantically in the long term. After a year, Gail left to chase an opportunity on 60 Minutes 2. Ironically, being the only core legacy character to consistently return to Woodsboro probably made it easy for the Stab 3 production team to find him. Sometime after Gail leaves, Dewey accepts an out-of-town job himself. In Hollywood! Or at least Studio City. Due to his first-hand experience, he comes on to Stab 3 as a technical advisor. This is kind of a 180 for him, considering he showed no interest in the Stab franchise before this, but he was probably lonely after things didn't work with Gail, and the cast of this movie, pretending to be his friends, were the closest he could have to actually having those friends together. Inevitably, they were not the only remnants of his past to be found on this production. The return of Ghostface would wreak havoc on more than just the shooting schedule. <laughs> In July 1999, Dewey serves as the technical advisor on a recreated set version of Woodsboro frozen at each brutal murder, including his sisters. Surely that can't be helpful for his grief processing. 
Despite this, it's not hard to figure out why the job is attractive for him. He has a little authority on set. Plus, he works most closely with actress Jennifer Jolie, who happens to be playing Gail Weathers. Just as Sydney had become sort of a surrogate sister for him during Scream 2, Jennifer is his surrogate girlfriend. Though I'm pretty sure it's more of an emotional surrogate than a physical one, with Jennifer referring to Dewey as her rock. He ends up moving into a trailer on her property, which if you know LA and housing costs is probably the nicest thing anyone's ever done for him. Sydney has moved into a life of seclusion with her whereabouts hidden from everyone, except Dewey, who seems to be his most focused when he knows that she's safe. Dewey isn't the only former Woodsboro resident on staff. Cotton Weary is set to make a cameo in the movie as himself. That is, until he becomes the victim of yet another ghost face killer. This prompts LA detective Mark Kincaid to hire the real Gail Weathers, seeing as how she literally wrote the book on Ghostface, placing her directly in the path of Dewey Riley. Well, surprise, surprise. Someone dies and Gail comes running. This is a confident, maybe even happier Dewey than the morose, broken man who showed up on campus in 1997. I'm not suggesting that living on a movie star's driveway because she reminds him of someone he loves is the ultimate dream for him, but I think his slightly improved state is probably tied to our main throughline in this video. After surviving two ghost face attacks, Dewey has gained a little respect. The actors see him as the real thing. Dewey grins at his Tom Prince casting in Stab 3, despite Gail's incredulous laugh. That alone is proof that he no longer needs to hang on her every word. That night, Ghostface stabs again, taking out another cast member. The next day, Dewey and Gail sit down to lunch, and Dewey looks perturbed when she reveals that the police approached her to help investigate the new murders. Sure, Gail wrote the definitive book on the Woodsboro murders, but Dewey was actually a cop. There are reasons why they might approach Gale over Dewey, like the fact that Dewey's a part of the production and probably a suspect. But from his point of view, he just got overlooked for the person he almost died for. You said you'd never leave Woodsboro. It's the only place that's real. But now you're here. Not with me. It's clear that Gale did want Dewey to come with her, but in his mind, she wanted to be someone else and didn't try to make it work in Woodsboro. He's deflecting from the reality that it was Dewey who never tried to meet her halfway in their romantic life. When it comes to catching Ghostface, however, he's all in. Off the record, he fills Gail in on the information he has, but he's interrupted by a page from Jennifer Jolie. He gives Gail the same line he gave her after their first kiss. Wait, Dewey, where are you going? I'm on duty. A distraught Jennifer catches Dewey up on the second victim, Sarah Darling, and the pattern is revealed. Each victim has been taken out in the same order as the deaths in the Stab 3 script. And next up is Gail, which means trouble for Jennifer. Dewey tries to take control of the situation, using the authority and respect he's fostered as a former law enforcement hero. However, not everyone sees him the same way he sees himself. Hey, do drop. Can I have a word? Jennifer's bodyguard, Stephen Stone, still speaks down to him and reminds him who the professional celebrity guard is and who the failed cop whose resume reads like an obituary is. Ouch. I absolutely love the nickname Dewdrop, though. With Stone taking care of Jennifer, Dewey joins Detective Kincaid and the LAPD down at the Stab 3 production office, where he's reminded that there were three versions of the script, thus three different people that could die next. Due to all the unknowns, production on Stab 3 is cancelled, so the remaining cast members all meet back at Jennifer Jolie's for a gloomy rap party, if you want to call it that. Turns out, gathering all the possible victims in one house wasn't the perfect idea, and this leads to a ghost face attack. Stephen Stone gets a knife in Dewey's trailer. Who's the dewdrop now? He manages to stagger out to the front door where he collapses in front of everybody, sending the whole cast into a panic. Suddenly, new script pages start coming in on Jennifer's fax machine. Dewey realizes it's a trap and orders everyone to go outside, but his Hollywood counterpart, Tom Prince, lets his curiosity get the better of him, which ends up being a fatal mistake. The blast propels Dewey, Jennifer, and Gail downhill, splitting the party up. He finds himself in a real Sophie's choice, with Jennifer calling for him from one direction and Gail from the other. He doesn't hesitate before marching towards Gail, the real Gail, and reaches her just in time to fire off a shot and save her from Ghostface. Thanks for saving me. That's heaven. The next day, Sydney finally arrives in Los Angeles, hoping to help solve the mystery, and shortly after, they receive a video containing the rules of surviving the rare horror trilogy by none other than the deceased Randy Meeks. Unlike when Randy tried to deliver the rules to him at Windsor College two years prior, and Dewey interrupted him to get to the point, this time, he's taking notes. This really emphasizes Dewey's growing belief in the rules, and thus, his willingness to learn them. He's not just randomly searching for a killer, he's learning how they operate. With a more focused direction provided by Randy, Rip, Gail unsurprisingly splits off. Do you want us to come with you? I work better alone. 
No, history says you really don't. Meanwhile, Dewey is doing his own investigating on set when he hears Sydney calling for him. He fights through his nerve damage to reach her as fast as he can, but the second Dewey hobbles in, Ghostface runs off. The whole thing is a parallel of Billy's first attack on Sid, and Dewey is the first responder on the scene in both instances. Once Sydney is settled at the precinct, and following a confrontation with Stab's producer about Maureen Prescott's past in Hollywood, Dewey, Gail, and Jennifer head off to the birthday party of Roman, the director of Stab 3, and totally not Ghostface or Sydney's half-brother. The party splits up again, because they just never learn. But Dewey and Gail stay back to wait for Sydney to arrive, where they discover Ghostface mask, cell phone, and voice changer. Then they split up, because they just never learn. Gail and Jennifer only manage to find him moments before he gets popped by Ghostface, who slices him on the arm and knocks him out of commission just long enough to take two more victims from the Stab 3 cast. As he comes to and examines his injuries, Gail brings him his gun, or someone's gun, I've kind of lost track at this point, and he sees the bedroom mirror moving. He risks the seven years of bad luck by shooting through it, and Jennifer comes crashing through the glass shards. Or should I say, Jennifer's body? Dewey is mortified to lose the cast member he connected most with, and Gail is even more mortified to see the grim image of someone who is supposed to be portraying her. So they do the most logical thing anyone would do in this scenario. Not really, they split up again. When he realizes he can't find her, he freaks out. Gail calls his phone and tells him that she's trapped in the basement, but because of the voice changer, he second guesses this, suspicious that it may be the killer trying to lure him down there. However, when he hears her scream, movie title, he opens the basement door anyway, and Ghostface knocks him out with the dull end of a knife. As a result, Dewey and Gale are captured by Ghostface, but luckily for them, he keeps them alive to use as bait to lure in his main target, Sydney. And Dewdrop can only watch as Ghostface chases her into the secret screening room, where all would be revealed. It was Roman, who is also Sydney's half brother. Sorry I lied. After breaking free from the chair he is bound in, Dewey frees Gale and retrieves the gun from Detective Kincaid, who has also been injured by Roman. Dewey ends up being the last cop standing. Perhaps this gave him the confidence to return to the police force in the future. Or perhaps it was the heroics that would soon follow. After barging into the library and sticking a pair of tweezers in the outlet to turn off the power? Don't try that at home. He's able to navigate the secret corridors of the mansion and ram down the screening room door right after the conclusion of Sid's battle with Roman. This time, he demonstrates that he really was paying attention during Randy's tape, because he's the one to remind the others of the horror movie rules, this time about the killer being superhuman at the end of a trilogy. As usual, Randy was spot on. Third time's a charm, I guess. This time, Dewey stays in the game long enough and finally gets to be the hero. Sometime later, the group returns to Sydney's remote home in the hills to help her settle back in, I suppose. Knowing that this adventure is over, and with Roman gone, possibly for good, he probably realizes that his time with Gail will be coming to a close soon if he doesn't make a move. He asks her to sign his copy of the Woodsboro Murders, only when she opens it up, she finds an Andy Dufresne-style proposal. Well, I know it'll never work. <laughs> You know it'll never work, but what I'm asking is just to see if we're wrong. They weren't wrong. What? They weren't. However, the two did go on to get married in 2001, and things would go well for a while. With the superstar limo of Scream sequels behind them, the new millennium was much quieter and more peaceful for Dewey and Gale. They settled down together in Woodsboro, with Gale finally giving a chance to that dreaded small town life. As I alluded to earlier, Dewey became a cop again, and this time he quickly rose up through the ranks due to his extensive experience. As years went by without a new ghost face, his younger reputation of Deputy Dewey Boy and Dewdrop slowly faded to memory. Eventually, he became Woodsboro's sheriff, finally achieving the strongest symbol of respect he had long sought after. Dewey maintains his care and protectiveness over his loved ones, though Sydney is of course not in Woodsboro. Regardless, he holds on to his surrogate brother role and reads Sydney's book, Out of Darkness, cover to cover when it comes out. As the added responsibilities of his job began to require more of him, cracks start to show in his relationship with Gail, who is having a hard time finding her purpose after moving from nonfiction to fiction and suffering from writer's block, which is made worse by the lack of a friend network in the area. In September 2011, and I'm basing that date on this line from Scream 2022, Sheriff Riley wakes up and goes on his way, but the morning begins with a haunting similarity to the night of the Woodsboro murders, with a teenager blowing past him at an alarming speed. It's also the anniversary of the day he lost his sister, which means kids have decorated the town square with ghostface paraphernalia. 
He shows up to find his deputy, Judy Hicks, already at work removing them. She's harboring a not-so-secret crush on Sheriff Riley, but he's staying faithful to Gal. And if he didn't go for Jennifer Jo Lee when he was single, he's probably not straying from Gale at this point. They get a call on the radio about two teenage girls who were stabbed the night before and quickly go to investigate. Deputy Hicks traces a phone call from the scene of the crime to a bookstore, which just happens to be where Sidney Prescott is doing a signing for her new publication, Out of Darkness. Dewey discovers evidence from the previous night's crime planted in Sidney's rental car. Guess she's not getting that deposit back. Although he doesn't really suspect her, he takes Sid back to the precinct for mandatory questioning, and to add to the drama, he has to break up an argument between his jealous wife and Deputy Hicks. Gail blows up on him, because she expects to be part of the investigation just like in the past, but now that Dewey is sheriff, he's technically not supposed to divulge police information to a reporter, and he's forced to send her off. This is a major moment for Dewey. Perhaps the biggest mistake he made in the first investigation was letting Gail distract him while he was on duty. Even if they are better off as a team, he's showing that he takes his newfound responsibility responsibility seriously. When Gail declares that she's going rogue, the expression of hurt on his face says it all. He's risking what's left of his relationship by sticking to the law. Eventually, he's gonna have to choose between being the perfect sheriff or being the perfect husband. For now, he places 24-hour police surveillance on Sydney for her protection, but that doesn't stop the new Ghostface from taking another teenage victim nearby. So Sheriff Riley finds himself in the unenviable position of telling his community it's going to be fine when he very much knows it may not be as the killer would immediately demonstrate when Sidney's literary publicist is thrown off a parking garage in the middle of his press conference. Although being sheriff in the midst of a Scream movie is basically a lose-lose situation, it's cool to see Dewey in action, calling the shots. He's come a long way from the 25-year-olds taking orders and doing grunt work. However, his position requires him to conduct himself in a certain manner, as opposed to Gail, who can use less orthodox methods. Dewey later receives a call from her as she's staking out the Stabathon Film Fest, a gathering of high school film buffs to celebrate the Stab franchise, and she thinks the killer is about to strike. He mocks her for needing his help after going rogue, causing her to pout and hang up. He immediately realizes the danger she's in and rushes to her location, only to find her car, where he spots Ghostface sneaking up on her on the monitor, unable to do anything about it. He rushes into the barn where Stabathon is being held and fires a shot in the masked killer's direction, but not before Ghostface takes the name of the event literally and stabs Gail in the shoulder. Dewey's concern for his wife trumps his need to catch the killer, so he attends to her as Ghostface gets away. Jogging next to Gail as she's wheeled to an ambulance, Dewey has an epiphany. Perhaps thinking over the two times Gail had to do the same for him, that is, watching him go away on a stretcher, Dewey makes a pledge. No more on your own. It's you and me, forever. Not a promise he could keep. Anyway, Deputy Hicks calls with more grim news. Sydney's aunt, Kate Roberts, has lost her life along with two of Dewey's officers, Haas and Perkins. Without hesitation, Sheriff Riley hits the lights, cues the siren, and speeds off to meet Judy at Mrs. Roberts' home. Which is not the right spot, as he finds out when he gets a panicked phone call from Sydney, who explains that she's at Kirby Reed's house, and the killer is in the vicinity. Notice how Sydney doesn't call 911, she just calls Dewey directly. I hope to have that level of notoriety one day. I, I mean, I, I do. I do right now. Don't f*** with me. Dewey orders Deputy Judy to send all units to 329 Whispering Lane. Dewey is no longer the lone cowboy he once was, but this new pair of killers are a different breed than Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker were, and the brigade of officers could not possibly contend with what they would find. Dewey and the police arrive, only to find out that they were too late. When they get to Kirby's house, they find nothing but a living room full of victims. Or so it seems. The survivors, Jill, Sydney, and Kirby, are transferred to the hospital. The only one who is conscious is Jill, and she has an oddly unenthusiastic reaction to learning that Sydney was still alive. This doesn't showcase Dewey's ineptitude as much as it highlights how he and Gail really do work better together than apart, which is proven shortly after, when Dewey stops by her room. She asked if you were okay. She thinks you guys should write a book together with your matching wounds. Why, she was stabbed in the shoulder? How did she know I was too? Dewey and Gail realize it at the same time. Jill would not know where Gail's stab wound was unless she was in league with the one who created it. He rushes back to Sydney's room, where he's greeted with a bedpan to the face and beaten down until he's out cold. Like his first two go-arounds with Ghostface, he stays down for the entire finale. What hit me? Don't ask. But for the fourth time now, the trio, this time accompanied by Deputy Hicks, are able to take down their deranged adversaries. 
sense. He may not have realized it at the time, but this was the tail end of the golden era of Dewey Riley. He has Gale, Sydney is safe, and he has a competent deputy working for him in Hicks. He and Gale recommitted to each other, but at some point over the next decade, Gale's claustrophobia pertaining to small town America creeped up and threatened their relationship once more. This time, it was Dewey who had to make concessions, and he left his hometown behind to move to New York City, where Gale would become the host of Good Morning with Gale Weathers, for all of about two months, before giving up on the marriage to return to Woodsboro. For someone who's supposed to be the bravest character in the franchise, he doesn't do too well outside of his comfort zone, whereas Gale lasted more than 12 years outside of hers. His old job was waiting for him, probably held in the interim by Deputy Judy Hicks, as you would expect for the man who is basically a Woodsboro folk hero. But the split from Gale seems to just break him. With his growing disconnect from the people he crafted his identity around, he becomes a hermit and moves into a dingy trailer in the outskirts of town. I guess he was used to the trailer life from his time on Jennifer Jolie's driveway, but it's still a downgrade from the big house he once shared with Gale. Dewey has a habit of revisiting the worst moments of his life, and he's had quite a few. He also becomes an alcoholic, and it seems that his personal issues began to affect his work, and eventually he was asked to resign from the Woodsboro Police Department, and Deputy Hicks was promoted to Sheriff Hicks. After spending his whole life trying to earn respect, they finally stripped the last accolade he had to his name. Life became pretty sad for Dewey. With his sister's ashes on his mantle, the only thing he had to look forward to every day was seeing his ex-wife's show on TV. With no ghost face and no one he cared about to protect, Dewey felt that he had lost his purpose. He continued to sink deeper until 2021, 25 years since Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker first asked, what's your favorite scary movie? Opportunity would come knocking at his door. Samantha Carpenter and her boyfriend, and definitely not Ghostface, Richie, come around looking for an expert in regards to a new set of Ghostface attacks. Experts don't typically fare well in Scream. Just ask Randy Meeks, Charlie, and Robbie. The fact that they want to talk to him so badly, even when he doesn't want to get involved, illustrates that because of his experiences, he still has the respect of the younger generation who desperately need his help. This is a small win for Dewey, but he's still skeptical. Give me one good reason why I should talk to you. I'm Billy Loomis's daughter. That's a terrible reason for me to talk to you. While this is a Dewey broken as we have ever seen him before, his sympathetic side gets the better of him and he gives them a couple minutes to lay down the rules. There are certain rules to surviving a stab movie. Believe me, I know. Rule number one, never trust the love interest. He's on the money with that one. After initially being skeptical before adopting the rules in Hollywood, Dewey is now a believer. He even seems to have mastered the art of writing the rules. Rule number two, the killer's motive is always connected to something in the past. I'm related to Billy. Yep, Sam is being set up solely because of her blood relation to Billy Loomis. Rule number three, and this is the most important rule, the first victim always has a friend group that the killer is a part of. Damn, this is the first time a character has ever been 100% correct with the rules. Usually the rules are more of a best practices rather than something set in stone. Sam requests Dewey's help, but he wants to stay far away from the danger. Are you kidding me? I've been stabbed nine times. I've got permanent nerve damage and a fun little limp. You think I want to do that again? Nine times so far. But after some tough contemplation, he makes a call to Sydney, letting her know that it's happening again and warning her to stay safe and stay away. Not knowing that he's resigned from the police, she assumes that Dewey is going to be protecting the next generation of victims, which makes him reconsider his own actions. Was shutting Sam and Richie out when he could potentially help really something that Dwight Riley would do? Next, he has to man up and call the ex, Gail. So he texts, of course. Ghostface is back. Don't come here. Hope you're doing well. He begins to type out, I still, and we never see what he's still, but we can safely assume he was about to say, I still have your copy of the Woodsboro murders with all of the pages cut through the center. What would you like me to do with it? It must have been Sydney's words combined with the fact that he has nothing else to do in his life that convinced Dewey to pull out his trusty old handgun, resting on the same mantle of remembrance as his tribute to Tatum and photo of Gail. He's symbolically reaching into the past one more time. He somehow finds where Sam and Richie went and offers his assistance. He finds himself in a suspect roundup at the home of Mindy and Chad Meeks, the niece and nephew of his old pal Randy, where naturally Dewey is suggested as a suspect. But what's my motive? You got stabbed a billion times, got dumped by your famous wife and crawled into a bottle. I think it's safe to say you're on the suspect list. Well, maybe you're the killer because that cut 
deep. Ouch. At least he didn't call him Dewdrop, though. Dewey catches up on the attack so far, and the theme this time is familial connections to the past. Tara was the first to be attacked, and her half-sister is Billy Loomis's daughter, so she was also attacked. They both survived, but Stumacher's nephew, Vince, wasn't so lucky. The pattern would continue later that day when Sheriff Judy Hicks and her son Wes are both killed in broad daylight. Dewey shows up at the crime scene to grieve for his former deputy and friend, and perhaps do a little bit of investigating on his own. It is here where he's spotted, by Gale. Would the pressure of a new Ghostface investigation forge renewed bonds between them, or would the reunion lead to more fighting? Dewey was quickly going to find out. As is the tradition of their relationship, Dewey and Gale reunite under morbid circumstances. Text. Ow. Well, tell me the killer is back in a text. Ow, that hurts. Good. He tries to justify it by saying she was on the air at the time. And when he spots a camera crew with her, jabs back, criticizing her for falling back into her old ways of trying to capitalize on tragedy for a good news story. It's the same argument they've had since they met back in 1996. So fittingly, they're wearing the same colors that they wore when they were first formally introduced. Where there was excitement in that first meeting, this reunion is tinged with sadness and regret. Dewey expresses his shame at not being able to last in New York City and taking off in the middle of the night. The worst thing you can be in Dewey's mind, other than a murderer, is a coward. You are a lot of things, Dewey. But you are not a coward. Just were meant to be in Woodsboro. That might not be it, because he is in Woodsboro and doing worse than ever. Without his old friends there with him, he's living in a cemetery of everything he's lost. As Gail goes on camera for her report, it dawns on Sam that no one's at the hospital keeping an eye on Tara, much like Dewey didn't keep an eye on Sydney in 1996 or Randy in 1997. And the two speed off, hoping to get there before somebody else does. In the car, Dewey listens in as Sam calls Richie, but ends up reaching someone with the infamous ghost face voice on the other line instead, who gives her the choice of who will survive, her boyfriend or her sister. She stalls as they park and get in the elevator up towards Tara's room. Maybe you're too weak for this franchise. Maybe you're right. Or maybe I'm just stalling for time. Head. She probably shouldn't have said that. If Tara and the killer didn't happen to be right on the other side of the elevator door, her sister would have been screwed. Lucky for them, when the doors slide open, Dewey sees someone in a Ghostface costume and fires off a couple shots, which are evaded. So Dewey and Ghostface engage in melee, slamming each other around, glass flying. Looking back on this, the person in the Ghostface costume during this scene must be Amber, who is only 110 pounds, or 49 kilograms, throwing all 161 pounds, or 73 kilograms of Dewey off her with some kind of judo roll. And they said Scream 3 was supposed to have the quote-unquote supernatural killer. Speaking of which, his Scream 3 experiences would come back to haunt him here. At first, Dewey gets the upper hand. Not today! <laughs> He headbutts her backwards and grabs the gun, firing three shots into her body, dropping Amber into a bookcase. Dewey quickly escorts Sam, Tara, and Richie to the elevator before remembering the advice that Sydney gave him to help defeat Roman more than 20 years beforehand. The head. What? You have to shoot him in the head. They always come back. Dewey, who gives a f I do. No, do it! And the doors close, leaving Dewey alone. He turns and unholsters his gun, reloading as he walks, Clint Eastwood probably on his mind. Stepping over broken glass to Ghostface's prone form, Dewey aims when his cell phone rings. It's Gale. The momentary distraction gives Amber just enough time to counter, burying one knife into his guts and the other, fittingly, into the same spot on his back that Stu Mocker and Deborah Loomis had scarred in the past. She tears her knives from Dewey's body simultaneously and kicks his lifeless body to the ground. Initially, the way he was carried out on the stretcher made me think he would survive. After all, we've seen him exit a Scream movie in similar fashion before. But then you start to realize, you take someone to the hospital to treat an injury, not away from it. Dewey is headed to the morgue. Amber later explains that they had to kill Dewey to give their inevitable stab movie some weight and try to prove that this wasn't just another cash grab sequel. Given the medicine and the nature of Scream, we can assume that Dewey's passing was an intentional move by the new writers and director to give their movie stakes and help launch a brand new chapter of Scream. Dewey's death was devastating for his surrogate family, Sidney and Gail. For 25 years, it had been Dewey who showed up for them. The only people his death could have possibly been more devastating for were his fans. Not since Randy Meeks had the fandom been so incensed and shocked at a Scream death, and it was because of the actor David Arquette's parallels with the character Dewey Riley that made him feel so real for the audience. David Arquette put a lot of himself into Dewey, and his life began to parallel that of the fictional character he portrayed. 
David met his eventual wife, Courtney Cox, aka Gail Weathers, at a pre-party before the filming of the original screen. Like their on-screen personas, they fell in love, but it was not all smooth sailing. A year later, in mid-June 1997, Courtney allegedly detested him on the set of Scream 2. Like Dewey and Gail, David and Courtney are very different people. Scream 2 makes references to Cox's Friends co-stars David Schwimmer and Jennifer Aniston, probably an intentional reference considering the romantic animosity between Dewey and Gail. Scream 2 also features Dewey working with local law enforcement, and Sheriff Hartley is played by David Arquette's dad, Louis Arquette. The Arquette family has been in the film industry for generations. In August of 1997, David's mother, Brenda Olivia Marty, would pass away from breast cancer, creating another emotional link to Dewey, whose mother, Mrs. Riley, is never mentioned again in the series. Scream 3 had Dewey and Gail finding their way back to each other by the end and committing the relationship to marriage. Sure enough, in real life, David Arquette and Courtney Cox were married one month before Scream 3 began filming in 1999. Dewey's statement about them never working because they're too different was a reality that David was facing with Courtney. David once said he was the live wire and Courtney was his grounding force. Then, on April 26, 2000, David Arquette would very controversially become the World Championship Wrestling Heavyweight Champ. His belt status would be hotly debated by wrestling fans, with David Arquette treated as a joke. The bout was considered by most to be a publicity stunt for Arquette's wrestling movie Ready to Rumble, and David did not gain the respect of real professional wrestlers whatever that means. However, Arquette was completely serious in his efforts as a professional wrestler and fought very hard to prove himself, almost to his death. Respect became a through line in his life just as it did in Dewey's. A decade later, Arquette's marriage to Courtney Cox was crumbling and they were in couples therapy by the time that the fourth scream was released. The gulf of emotional distance between them is reflected in Dewey and Gail from the top of Scree form. Yes, I pronounce things how they are spelled. Their relationship problems in the movie are capped by an intense vow by Dewey to never leave her again. IRL, it was just a few months after shooting, in October 2010, when David and Courtney were separated. The next decade wouldn't be any easier than the last. In 2011, he entered rehab for alcohol and drugs, and in 2013, he and Courtney are legally divorced. Once again, this is all reflected in The Fifth Scream, which gives details about Dewey Riley crawling into a bottle and ending his marriage with Gail. Reflecting on their divorce, David Arquette stated, On the inside of our rings, it says, a deal's a deal, he says. I felt really abandoned at that point, like she'd broken the deal. Although, it was reversed in the movie for some reason. Dewey was the one to leave her. David's life took another mournful turn when his sister, Alexis Arquette, died in September of 2018. Two months later, David, still in his bid to earn the respect of the pro wrestling world, was sliced in the neck when his opponent smashed a light tube over his head in a live match in LA. With concerns David could bleed to death, he was rushed to the emergency room. Obviously, he survived to go on to be in Scream 2022, but his character in that movie really did bleed to death in the ER. I had this one therapy session where I was talking about my parents' marriage and how it was so hard on them. Then I realized both of my parents are dead and all of this pain is living inside me. It was Scream 2022 that reunited Courtney and David on screen. In real life, they're connected by their daughter. In the movie, they are connected by their past. So there are some real emotions flowing in the scene where they come face to face. In an article by New York Times, Arquette acknowledged that being in a movie with Cox again was inherently awkward. It's been 25 years of our lives, he said. We've grown up together. We have a child together. He explained, however, that he could not pass it up. It's a cathartic experience just to be able to act opposite Courtney. When the cameras rolled on their first scene together, it was a tearful moment, and not just because the script called for it. Cox said of our cat, he got very emotional while he was filming it. He said the next day, the crew didn't look at him. It's insane how invested David Arquette is with the character of Dewey Riley. Those are real photos of Arquette and Cox from their real relationship on the mantle in Scream 2022. Scream was built on meta-commentary and became the flagship for meta-cinema. Grief was already an unspoken theme in Scream, and is now almost an entire genre on its own with films like Midsummer, Hereditary, The Vavitch, and... The Babadook. It's an amazing meditation on motherhood and grief. Dewey became the Scream representative of grief, and his real-life counterpart, David Arquette, walked down that same road alongside him. In addition to the wrestling incident, there were many times that David almost bit the dust himself, including a car crash and a heart attack, like his father and grandfather before him. Talking to Variety, Arquette had to say this on the controversial final scene. I mean, you can't take Sydney. Sydney is a survivor. And there was something noble about it for Dewey. He was there to protect Sydney and the people of Woodsboro. 
There was a scene between Dewey and Gale, and there was a take they didn't use where I was super emotional. I sort of ad-libbed, I'm a failure, I couldn't save Judy, I couldn't save my sister. I think it was actually too emotional, like it was too much. And a lot of that emotion that I was going through at that time was mourning a loss. The loss of Wes was heavy on our hearts, especially in that scene. The only reason Dewey even made it long enough to become the hero, be respected by the fandom, and become an authority within the franchise is due to David Arquette's own drive to be better and earn respect. I'm sure the OG 90s fandom will probably never stop imagining different scenarios that bring Dewey back, as they have for Randy, but no matter how you slice it, pun intended, Dewey was meant to die in Scream 2022. Against all odds, and maybe sense, he became the Clint Eastwood of Scream, the town hero riding out on his Bronco to rid the West of Ghostface. If you want more information on the meta insanity that is Scream, click on that playlist on the left for my analysis of characters like Randy, Billy Loomis, Casey Becker, and others. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, unless it gets held up in review again. Ring the death bell for all notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.